Hello, Internet. These two cards came from a viewer like you. EVGA 1080 Ti, cost around 250 bucks today, and the MSI Lightning, that costs nearly double that. Let's see which one's worth the price. I'll start with the EVGA first. Customer stated it does not boot, so let's take it apart and see what's preventing it from booting. As you may have already noticed, the car had never been opened before, and that's always a good sign. Another thing you may have noticed is that when I remove the screws around the core, I remove them in an X pattern. This is done to evenly release the tension, preventing accidental cracks around the corner of the core. Okay, so the card is now disassembled, so let's do some measurements. 12 volt kilo ohms, 3.3 10 kilo ohms, 1.8 800 ohms, 90 ohms on PEX, 1.2 kilo ohms on the 5 volt, another 12 volt here, and here are both kilo ohms. Memory is 70. And the core I measure in relationship to the 12 volt line because its resistance is very low and there's nothing there, so we're good. Let's plug the car into the PCI Express tester and see if all the LEDs are lighting up. And they are. I still want to check the actual reading of the first data lines on the front, both of which are equal, and also on the back, which are also equal as well. Next, I go to a clock reference and PEX reset. Everything is looking good. All right, next step is to power the card and see how many amps it will draw in the idle state. And it looks like just a little over 1.3 amp, which is a good sign. Now let's switch to the riser and see if we have all the required voltages. And I'll start with PEX. If I have PEX, it means we already have memory, which means we already have the core. In case you didn't know, core comes first, then the memory, and then PEX. So if we have PEX, it means we have everything else. Next, I want to check the memory with an oscilloscope. If you don't have an oscilloscope, you can get away with a multimeter that can measure frequencies. In this case, I get 300 kilohertz on memory and 314 on the core. Just because I see good frequencies does not mean that the signal is good. For instance, this is a good signal. This one is bad. The only way to see this is to use an oscilloscope. If you do have an oscilloscope when you get a funny looking signal, you might want to go watch this video here for a possible solution. In our case, both memory signals look good, and so are all the cores. Okay, so let's put the card into a riser using this provided cable uh, to check if the motherboard recognizes the card. The downside of using a riser is that it will limit communication to only two PCI Express lanes, so the card can only boot as PCI Express 1, which is enough to get a picture, so it doesn't really matter. Motherboard beeps, indicating that it does not recognize the device. Okay, first possible suspect is that the card is stuck on reset. To check that, we go to the back of the board and we find U511. This five-legged IC is a logical AND gate, meaning that something and something else has to be true in order for it to output a signal. In other words, when this chip gets powered on this pin, it checks if this pin and this pin both have voltage on them. And if that's true, it will output voltage to this pin. So let's check and see if it actually works. Here we have 1.8 volt to power the chip. Then we have 3.3 uh, on this one. Nothing on this one, which means the output will also be zero. And if you're like me and you don't do this every day, Sometimes you make rookie mistakes without even realizing it. The mistake I made here is that when I was testing it, the riser was not connected to the motherboard. And since PEX reset comes directly from the motherboard, it is no surprise I have zero volts. 
Once I connected the riser to the motherboard, I did get the voltage on the second pin as well as on the output pin. But during the measurement, HDMI switch decided to automatically select a different video source. So I don't have a video on that. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. In any case, the car still does not boot, so next I'll look at the frequency generator. We should have 27 MHz. And we do. Okay, so next what I want to check is the BIOS chip to see if it has any signs of life. The way to identify the BIOS chip is you look for an 8 leg IC that has some kind of a color mark, like this. If you're not sure, you can confirm this with the board view. Board view will show you that this IC has ROM pins on it. Looking at this cheat sheet, it says that the pin number 2 is the data output from the BIOS chip itself, and the pin number 5 is the data input coming from the motherboard. First. Let's see if we have any voltage. This is a 1.8 volt BIOS chip and we have 1.8 volt. Now let's look at the data in. Nothing there. Now let's look at the data out. Nothing there either. What I can do now is try to flash this card with the correct BIOS. And since I use this exact card myself, I will simply dump my BIOS using GPU-Z. Then I need to take a close look at the chip to identify it correctly, so that the software can program it correctly. With everything connected, I will click the flash button and wait for it to finish. Once card BIOS was flashed, let's see if we see any activity. Both output and the input lines show signs of communication. And the motherboard doesn't complain anymore, so let's plug in the HDMI cable and see if we get a picture. Also, I will plug in my thumb drive so I can run the memory test at the same time. And it looks like we have a picture, and even the memory test has passed. As I was assembling the card, I found a small piece of pad got ripped. No problem. I'll simply cut that section away and take a piece somewhere else where it seems to be excessive. This memory chip seems to have more pad than it needs, so I will trim a small piece off of it and use it to patch this hole here. Card is now assembled and ready to start. At first, it seemed like something is terribly wrong because the GPU Z does not recognize any of the sensors. But after a second, drivers were installed, I reloaded the GPU Z again, and all sensors are there and everything looks good. There's no reason not to run this for too long, so I will fire up some gaming engines to ensure the card has no problems with uh, those, and it looks like they're all going smooth. And with all of that done, it concludes this repair, and once again, proving that EVGA cards are still good and running strong to this day. Now let's switch to one of the most premium 1080Is from MSI. Customers stated that there were sparks flying over the 8-pin connectors. So let's take it apart and see what would cause this. It looks like the card had been taken apart before, so hopefully nothing went wrong. I suspect this card performs just as good as any 1080 Ti, but the price is double that. We'll see if this card worth it, shall we? Once I remove the backplate, I ask myself, it's great that MSI decided to cool the back of the GPU, but why didn't they add a couple of pads to cool the memory? This isn't critical, but for the price range, I expected pads everywhere.
Okay, so once the heatsink is removed, what we get here is the cancer of all cooling designs. The only area that actually does provide cooling benefits of the radiator, including the core of course, are these capacitors here. These coils here, while they do have pads on them, pads do not make good contact with the radiator because there's hardly any surface area to make contact with. Same for the coils on the memory phase. Everything else sitting under this bracket is left to operate at the boiling temperatures. MOSFETs, memory chips, drivers, etc. EVGA has a similar design, but they have put pads in between this bracket, making good contact with the radiator. MSI, on the other hand, decided it's not needed. In any case, let's start with some basic measurements and see what we find. 12 volt kilo ohms, 3.3 volt, 270 ohms, which is unusually low. 1.8 volt is 600K, which is unusually high. PEX is 90 ohms, that's normal. 5 volt is 600 kilo ohms, which is also unusually high. And I wonder if my multimeter is dead at this point. Roughly 70 ohms on memory. These coils here are all 12 volts and we have kilo ohms on all of them. First pair of data lines at the front are equal. Same thing on the back side, measuring after the capacitors. Both are equal. Next is clock reference. Looks good. And now PEX reset. Also looking good. As a good habit, I will verify the remaining data lines with the PCI tester and I will power on the card to see how many amps it will draw. 1.6 amps seems like a good number, so let's start measuring for all the required voltages. One thing you may have noticed that I only use two 8-pin connectors. Let's see if we're able to get all the required voltages with one connector missing. We have 12. 1.8, PEX, core, but we don't have memory. I suspect the third 8-pin connector powers the memory phase, so let's swap the connectors and see what changes. There we go, we now have voltage on memory. With all three plugs in place, let's boot the card and see if we get a picture. And there we go, we have a picture, followed by reassembling the card, running some basic tests for a few minutes and I thought to myself, there's nothing wrong with the card. What I did find wrong was that the metal bracket was extremely hot, especially the near 8 pin connector, causing the cables to get soft. If I run this card for a long time with poor ventilation, I would likely end up having the very same problem customer had stated. Lightning strikes would fly out the cable. Lightning strikes. You get it? That's why they named this card MSI Lightning. If only MSI would add some thermal paths to establish connection between the metal bracket and the radiator heatsink, this problem would not exist. With that said, this piece of hazardous garbage is a no fix, no charge. It'll go back to its owner to attempt to fry their power supply once more. Guys learned something today, and if you did, please give this a video a like, comment below and subscribe for more repairs. Goodbye.